every single one of us will get an opportunity to develop and apply our coping skills because life gives us no shortage of opportunities to adjust, whether it's going from elementary to middle school, starting a family, changing careers, or aging. We're constantly being faced with challenges that require us to rise to the occasion and adapt to a new normal. This week, I'm speaking with Dr. Shannon Holder, family and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, about adjustment disorder. You're listening to The Purple Stethoscope. I am your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. None of the information in this podcast is sufficient nor intended to diagnose your personal medical issue but there's a lot to learn. So let's start the show. Hey guys, I am back this week and, you know, just reflecting on a lot of different phases and things in my own life, watching patients go through changes in their lives. Nothing will turn your life upside down faster than a medical diagnosis that requires you to take medicines and go to a bunch of doctor visits or be in the hospital or have different procedures done. You know, I watch people have this kind of reckoning um, with with their life. Like it's a, you know, it's a second chance. What have I been doing? What do I need to do differently? And I've witnessed that as a caregiver as well. Um, So (laughs) it just had me thinking about all of the different times um, in my own life and especially with my children that I have seen them and that I have personally had to adjust to a totally different normal. It's hard going through life when people seem to have it all together Our culture really calls for us to keep our stuff tucked in. Um, The expectation is that I'm doing good over here. You're doing good over there. When I say, how are you? You say, fine. When you ask me how I'm doing, I say, I'm fine. And we don't really go beneath the surface. Uh, We don't really dig deeper. We don't really set up safe spaces um, within our communities. It's just... It's culturally unacceptable for somebody to ask you how you're doing and you just start crying and and going on and on about all the things going on in your life. Um, Maybe with our very close friends, uh, I can speak for myself and say I'm less inclined to do that when I know that my close friend is also going through things. Uh, So we keep a lot in. We keep a lot inside and don't express it and maybe even sometimes don't process that, but it comes out, you guys, it comes out in other ways. It comes out in rapid weight gain, um, trying to kind of eat those feelings away. It comes out in irritability, just snapping off at people, likely the people closest to you, not really Um, The people involved in the stressful situations, especially if it's like work or school, you know, I comes out with pain, physical pain, headaches, backaches, all kinds of stuff. And so what I wanted to do this week was speak to somebody who has experience uh, dealing with physical manifestations of emotional upset Um, because I think that's something that's a lot more prevalent than we talk about or, um, you know, really keep in a differential. Uh, When I say the word differential, I mean when somebody comes into the clinic and they have a complaint. So say someone comes in with a sore throat. We're going to have differential diagnoses, meaning a number of things that might look like this. So it might be a viral pharyngitis, uh, meaning they caught it from a virus that's going around. It may be bacterial, meaning it was caused by an organism. We may 
um, think of allergies, you know, seasonal allergies that kind of cause that um, post-nasal drip and, and soreness in the throat. And we may even think of something like um, reflux, right? So those are our differentials. And then we ask questions and do tests to kind of narrow that down. Physical manifestations of emotional pain or emotional upset is not really something that is mainstream for practitioners to keep in the differential. And that's when getting a really good history comes into play. Um, I get to do this a lot in my work because a lot of the time symptoms are coming on kind of abruptly. And when I ask people, so what was going on in your life at that time when those symptoms came on? I've heard everything from I lost a parent to I lost a spouse to I had a major move or work was really stressful. But a lot of times our physical symptoms may be connected with something that we're going through emotionally, if that makes sense. You may want to just... Um, Pay attention to yourself or or keep a journal with two columns, what I feel physically and what I feel emotionally. And notice how the two correlate, if that makes sense. Especially if you're someone who's been going and going and going into appointments, having all these tests done, everything's coming back normal because that actually adds to Um, emotional distress, right? It it makes you feel like, you know, nobody's listening to you, you're not heard, um, or maybe they're just missing something, right? So I want to encourage anybody who is dealing with chronic headaches, dealing with, um, you know, back pain, dealing with, you know, stomach issues and stomach upset and just different kind of vague symptoms in, in your body, Uh, to take a look at your emotional health and think about what's going on in your life. Think about whether or not you have the space and the safety to process the things that are going on in your life. Do you have a good support system? Do you have help with, you know, just the most basic things like... um, housework or grocery shopping or picking up your children. I'll tell you one thing. If you work eight hours and you spend an hour of your day commuting and you're responsible for pickups and drop-offs and dinner and housework and everything else, that is an awful lot for one person. And that's something that we really don't talk about culturally, especially amongst women, because historically, Women didn't work as much as we do today. And so taking care of everything else was the work. But if you're someone who's doing that on top of working, you know, you may want to consider uh, an emotional origin for some of what you're dealing with physically. Some physical things really are Uh, you can find objective evidence of, okay, um, weight gain and depression, you know, um, or weight loss and and anxiety or, or, you know, um, increased blood sugars and and a a diagnosis of diabetes after, um, you know, life changes that prevent you from being able to cook at home or exercise regularly. You know, those are objective things, but again, is the issue, you know, genetic? Is it something that you, what th- that was inevitable for you? Or is the issue really that we're just doing too much with not enough support and not paying attention to our physical and mental health because of all the distractions in our life? So, I'm going to let you all listen in on a conversation that I have with Dr. Shannon Holder. Um, She's just incredible, you guys, because she's somebody who was noticing 
these correlation of uh, physical symptoms and mental health and returned to school to get board certified as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Uh, She's been a registered nurse since 1996, became a family nurse practitioner, and worked as a family nurse practitioner for five years before going back to get her dual degree for psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner and a doctor of nursing practice. You know what? Can I just pause for a second and tell you all how blown away I am when I get to meet and interact with other women. And then, you know, we go to put these bios together and it's like, oh, you're a baddie. Like this is a real one. I mean, I'm talking about three advanced degrees here. Um, And so down to earth, as you'll see. Shannon found in her practice that people kept coming back for physical complaints rooted in mental health. She sees patients 13 and up for everything from adjusting to life's transitions to chronic mental health care. Um, Super knowledgeable, excited for you guys to listen in And not just listen to our conversation, but consider these things in your own life. Is this applicable to you? How is it applicable to you? If you strongly identify with what we're talking about, what can you do about it? I'll be back after our discussion. I am so excited to hear mental health care becoming a more regular part of conversations online, on social media, in person. But listen, don't get caught up in the buzzwords like self-care and boundaries and therapy. All of that stuff is great and all of it is really important. But sometimes we need a little bit more than strong boundaries. Sometimes we need a little bit more than a massage or a pedicure. Sometimes therapy is difficult to access. You can make an appointment with your primary care provider because you're not feeling like yourself. Maybe you've lost interest in doing some of the things you used to really enjoy. Maybe your appetite has changed. Your weight has changed. You've gone through a significant life change and just can't seem to recover. That's a perfectly fine reason to schedule an appointment with your nurse practitioner, physician or physician assistant, whoever you see for primary care. It might seem silly. A lot of times people think, well, I'm not sick. Why would I make an appointment? Well, all of our sickness isn't manifested in our body. Sometimes it's our minds that need help. There are short-term therapies, long-term therapies. Your primary care provider can help connect you to mental health services like counseling and therapy, but it's a great place to start. And I just wanted to take a moment to remind you that that's available. If you don't have access to a primary care provider, why not look on the back of your insurance card and call the phone number or visit the website listed. If you don't have insurance, you can check out freeclinics.com. I'll leave a link in the show notes to find someone that you can establish primary care with and they can lead you to services. If you're someone like me who has a job that offers the benefits of an employee assistant program, check it out and see what's available to you through that program. I know my program allows three uh, therapy visits per incident, and in the 16 years that I've been affiliated with my company, I've used it for multiple different things. It's a great benefit to have if you're somebody who's just trying to adjust. Some things you can do in the meantime are Talk with a friend. Remember the episode, How You Doing, Sis, with Dr. Sis Lena Ledbetter? One of her suggestions was spending some time opening up with a close friend. We know therapy is not available and accessible to everybody, 
You can also move your body, getting outside, breathing fresh air, going for a walk, listening to some music or a podcast, or better yet, walking with a friend or a pet. Those are a couple of things that can help. For some people, exercising and talking with friends simply isn't going to be enough. For some people, you may need medication for a short period or a more long-term solution to a mental health issue. Don't be afraid of that if that's you. What we all really want is to have quality of life. We want to be able to function and do the things that life called on us to do, as well as enjoying life in general. So I hope those tips were helpful. Let's get back to the show. Dr. Shannon Holder is a native New Yorker who started her nursing career in New York over 20 years ago. She's worked in various specialties such as labor and delivery, a level one trauma center, pediatrics, home care, interventional radiology, and primary care. Through her healthcare experiences, she noticed that mental illness was playing a significant role in those that were dealing with health issues. That's when she understood it was difficult to get well physically if you're broken mentally. Dr. Holder is board certified in both family and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. She holds her doctor of nursing practice and is the founder of Be Well Behavioral Health. Good afternoon, Dr. Holder. <laughs> Good afternoon. You can please call me Shannon. I'm okay with that. All right. I'll call you Shannon. I'm so excited to get to talk to you again. And I'm hoping to give the listeners a little taste of who you are and what you do. Um, can you give us some background? Just let us know how you came into the work that you're doing now and what that work is. Yes, I sure can. So I am currently a um, psychiatric nurse practitioner as well as a family nurse practitioner. I, I, um, I started as a young nurse. Obviously, I evolved and I went back to school for my, um, my master's. I started with my family nurse practitioner first. And um, from there, I seen a lot of concerns I had in regards to um, patients who had physical issues. I always seen a psychiatric or mental health component tied to that. And that prompted me to go back to school for my psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, And from there, I just propelled, you know, Um, I love both both specialties, but I know that they're both tied together. So because of that, um, I started to focus more so on psychiatry um, as I found that that was a big reason for patients not doing the medical stuff I had asked them to do. I see. Yeah. I I love hearing that there's someone out here who has made that connection and not just thought it, but really gone back to school and pursued expertise in that area because I tell you, some of my office visits, I don't even get to a physical exam until 30 minutes into the visit because there's so much other stuff, so much social history, so much circumstances, so much stress that's really affecting the physical problem. And it's like, we can't start here. We have to circle back and talk about some of the other things that are going on. So you are the owner of Be Well Behavioral Health, I understand. Yeah, private practice. Yes, private practice. So now um, you get to do things on your terms. How is that different than being Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I can't even tell you. I just remember like family practice. um, That was another concern I had because you, you only get 15 minutes and that is not enough time to like somebody comes in with a health issue. That's not enough time because as a nurse, you know, I look at patients holistically, meaning I look at the whole person. So with that, you know, you can't just say, oh, this is going on with you without knowing why 
they're not doing some of the things. Like you get a patient with high blood pressure. Why are they not taking their medication? Right. It's not that they're not compliant and they don't want to take their medication. Because let's be honest, nobody wants to be sick. But you have to look at the reasons why. And then we go back to mental health and social. Like how do I know that they are having circumstances, maybe not a place to live right. or, you know, you just don't know anyone's social issues. So I think it's important that you sit down and speak to patients about that. And 15 minutes was never long enough to do that. No. And now I can do things on my own terms where I have like 45 minutes to an hour with patients or longer, you know, and that gives me time to look at everything. That's awesome. I've, I've replaced in my own vocabulary, uh, non-compliant with inappropriate care plan. Yes, I don't I agree. call anybody non-compliant anymore. Yep, the onus I is agree. on us. How can I prescribe you something that you can't get, or if your medicine needs to be refrigerated exactly. and you're homeless, or there you on go, and on and yes. on. I love yes. that. So I hope you all are hearing this. Um, if you're <laughs> frustrated with the the times of appointments. Um, not getting to the root cause of issues. And there's some nurse practitioners out here making space for patients just like you. Yes. I'll never forget, I saw a young woman once who was morbidly obese. And, uh -huh. you know, we had tested her thyroid. We had tested other hormones. We were, you know, looking into all kinds of different, mainly hormonal reasons uh -huh. for her weight gain. And it was in that visit that I finally stopped and said, were you heavy as a child? And she said, mm. no. She was not heavy as a child. I said, when did you start gaining weight? And there it turns you go. out the two-year period when she started packing on tons and tons of weight was while she was being abused and molested. Oh, and yes. So here we are Ooh. sitting in this 15-minute medical yep. visit. And all, you know, all I can do in that time is give you a referral for counseling Yes. Um, and, and, you know, wish her well and, you know, explain yes. to her that, you know, I think there's more to this than a hormonal issue. So I, I love um, what you're doing. How about, can you share some examples of situations? I mean, you're, you were working as a family nurse practitioner. Oh yes. 20, 25 patients a day. Oh, okay. And yeah. what are some examples of scenarios where you recognize this is not a physical problem, the origin is actually psychiatric or mental health? Um, I remember my first experience, to be honest with you, was a patient that um, was a diabetic. And even though we were prescribing this medication for the patient, the insulin, um, we found that the patient was not taking the insulin as they should have been and found out the reason why is because the patient was recently became homeless and didn't have a refrigerator to store the insulin in. So, I mean, mm -hmm. all that came from just asking. And a lot of it came from the fact that, you know, we had like one person who would say, well, he just doesn't want to take the medication and that's when I always go back no one wants to be sick Thank just ask you. questions Thank I think you. it's so important that we ask questions and I understand 15 minutes may not be enough time but sometimes I've, I've been telling people sometimes you need to lead with the question of what's going on at home instead mm -hmm. of even talking about medical stuff sometimes if you leave with that patients start to open up and they will cry mm -hmm. because it's not their arm that may be hurting them or you know right. their their you know, chest hurting them. A lot of times it's the stress that they have feeling mm -hmm. overwhelmed, not being heard right. makes a, yeah, it makes right. a big difference. So that one uh, thing that happened with the patient who ended up being homeless, that was my first experience. And I was like, wow, look at this. This is tied to this. Mm -hmm. He, he wants to take the medicine, right? But he doesn't have a place to even store it. How do you, when you're running, sleeping on people's couch, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. But then yeah. you're able to make an appropriate care plan, whether that's done Absolutely. by the health department or having a, a visiting Absolutely. or a walk-in. Yeah. I Absolutely. Now, you treat patients ages 13 and up. Yes. I love middle schoolers. I do, too. They, 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 their transition is really hard, but it they're is. some of my favorite people. Right. Yeah. They're yeah, some yeah, of my like favorite. That's like the adolescent age. Yeah, they, I um, agree. They have the vocabulary to tell mm -hmm. you what's going on. Yes. But they haven't been trained out of speaking their truth just yet. And Very just, much so. I love <laughs> talking with them because they're just so expressive. But we, we touched on adjustment disorder. 
And I really wanted to make sure to include this in our discussion today for the listeners uh, mm-hmm. because it's huge. It's something people may not even yeah. know what it means when they hear it. And there are specific times in our life when we're all adjusting. And then there may be adjustments that aren't due to age or anything like that. Can you give some examples of different adjustment periods and what adjustment disorder is? Yes. Um, more or less, you know, it's just what it sounds like. You know, adjustment disorder is a perfect example. Kids, I see a lot of kids who start middle school because their transition is leaving elementary and their friends that they played, you know, uh, you know, recess with mm-hmm. and they go to middle school and the clicks start for them. Mm-hmm. And that's a very hard, to, you know, uh, adjustment because they were friends with people for so long and they just don't understand how all of a sudden they go to middle school and they're not like clicking with their friends anymore. Mm. You know, um, it, I see a lot of uh, kids who get adjustment disorders that come with anxiety and a lot of anxiety for them is like, you know, kind of crying, sad kids display physical symptoms. Their yes. stomach hurts. Yes. They go to the nurse's office a lot. That first, uh, that first couple of months is filled with being mm. at the nurse's office a lot. And I know just from speaking, Speaking at, uh, to nurses, um, a lot of times that's exactly what it is, the physical symptoms. So it comes with feeling overwhelmed, mm-hmm. stressed, and just not understanding. Like, they just don't get it. They don't understand. And no fault to them because their brains are still maturing. So right. they don't understand. So that is an adjustment order for them. It can last about six months. If it's anything longer than that, a lot of times, then we have to switch that diagnosis over to some anxiety and depression, depending on what's going on with them. Yeah. I yeah. have three children, and we've done sixth grade three times, and each Ooh. time I didn't know if I was going to make it. Yep, yep. <laughs> it was, it's hard, it was and it's hard for the parents too, right? Yes. You know, because they're adjusting too. Parents go through a lot of the same adjustment disorders that children would go to. It's mm-hmm. just at different levels because I think for adults we have on more, but for kids who are adolescents, we have to also remember that they're changing, mm-hmm. you know, hormonally, right? And we got physical changes, and you know, that's when they start looking at their bodies differently you know they start um comparing themselves to others especially you know they get into like sports activities and stuff it it becomes difficult and it's a really hard time middle school it does get better but it can be really difficult in the beginning and it's so easy for us as parents to kind of just blow it off like oh it's just hormones it's just they're they're going through hormone changes rather than asking them you know, you were friends with these kids last year. Who is your friend group this year? Or I yes, noticed that you're yes. dressing a little different or listening to different music. Or, yep. you know, you play basketball all the way up till now. Now you don't want to play anymore. What's going yes. on? What's going on? Having conversations with your kids, that's really important. Mm-hmm. I always tell a lot of parents, you know, to kind of check in, especially that transition with middle school, because the thing is the kids become a lot more reserved. And they, they I mean, let's be honest. The attitude start, you know, I always tell people 13 is is a turning point. They go to bed one way and they wake up another way. And that's just what it is. It's just being honest, you know. So I tell parents it's important to check in with their children and, you know, um, make sure you still keep those firm boundaries. But at the same time, a listening ear, you know, because a lot of times at the end of the day, they just want to be heard. You know, you may not understand all the time because that's just kids, but Mm -hmm. they want to be heard. Yeah. We do a fun thing at my house called Happy Crappies. Yes. Every day I ask them, you know, what was the happiest part of your day? What was the crappiest part? Me and daddy get in on it too. And lately, I love that. We've added a goal. So, what's your happy, what's your crappy, and what's your goal for, you know, the week coming or the next day or what have you? And, you know, especially, and my girl's the oldest. So, Mm -hmm. getting her to talk was not a problem. But then the, the, the other two are boys. And oh, yeah. And sometimes it would be like pulling teeth. Teeth. <laughs> they always come to you. I, I, tell, I tell my oldest, and this is terrible. I love you, Mariah. But sometimes when we get into <laughs> it, I say, you know what? You'll need me before I need you. <laughs> you oh! just don't cut That's terrible. But it's true. And they'll always come to us for something. And that's Absolutely. my time when I can say, all right, what's your happy, cap, happy, crappy, and go. Um, and I love gets that. them talking. It really does. And I learn. I learn things I had no idea were going yes. on. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. 
a lot yes. of their friends are uh, exploring their sexuality. There's a lot oh, of breakups, yes. you know, parents divorcing and, and dating and, you know, yes. we don't live in a bubble. Our children are right there, right there. Yes, they are. They <laughs> and are. They feel that's why it's type important. Of <laughs> yes, they do. You are absolutely right. They do. And that's why it's just important to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, I know as adults, we're just all very busy, but I think having those conversations mm -hmm. with your children creates an open communication, you know, mm -hmm. fosters communication. Like I said, rather they you think they heard you or you heard them, it starts the conversation piece or icebreaker to kind of just, and I love that happy crappy. I'm going to suggest that to a lot of my, it, my it's patients. It's wonderful. It really and the is. Goal, and I love it. It keeps them from going on and on off into a tangent mm -hmm. too. They have to have yep. a happy. And a, I know. love that. A nice balance. That's right. Because the glass is, is <laughs> I say it's not half empty or half full. It's refillable. Yep. Oh, so, yes. Um, going on up in the age groups, then we get to where my, where my oldest is, these college age 20 Ooh. somethings. Um, I love them as patients too because they still have that almost childish innocence. Yes. Like they have adult bodies, they're doing adult yes. things, and yes. they are on the edge of their seat listening for that education because no, a lot of times I find nobody's ever sat and talked with them about, mm -hmm. you know, their mental health or about yes. sexual health. I'm always very surprised. I still get, you know, um, young people well into their 20s that don't know how to protect themselves from STIs. I would agree. It's, I would agree with you on that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Parents, we talk about that too. It's important to have those open discussions too, really as uncomfortable as it may be. Yeah. It's easier for me. I found with other people's children. <laughs> my own. I like, agree. I can be the cool auntie, <laughs> but with my kids, I'm like having a half panic attack. <laughs> yes. I, I, I know. I hear you. I hear you. I want to talk about counseling and therapy. Yes. Now, um, I grew up in the church. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and therapy was not anything I knew anything about. I didn't know anybody who was in therapy. I did know people who would go and talk to the pastors, Yeah, and I talked to my pastors from time to time, but I noticed now um, therapy is much more socially acceptable. Yes. Um, but it's still, it's still a, not, I wouldn't yet call it a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. at least for African-Americans. Um, and I, I asked you when we spoke before mm -hmm. what were three myths about mental health. Oh, yeah. And the first thing that you said was going to see someone is weak. Mm -hmm. I loved hearing that, and it really resonated with me, especially with men. Shannon, yes. believe it or not, uh, a lot of times men, the way I get male patients is they're coming for symptoms of erectile dysfunction. Oh, yeah. And as soon as we get into the history, here comes, mm -hmm. as I'm sure is no surprise to you, <laughs> the psych <laughs> stuff, the performance um, anxiety, the, the life oh, yes. stress that shows up in that way. Mm -hmm. And... A lot of times, just like with the kids, they're just so grateful to have some mm -hmm. space to talk, yep. to be heard. Nobody's checking in and asking, how are you doing? But yep. I do get to that point where I, you know, will bring up therapy a lot. People with insurance may not realize a lot of times their insurance covers, you know, the copay. Yes. There's a lot of people with employee assistance programs that are completely yes. free to them to use. Uh, can you talk more about how it's not weak to go and see someone, um, what somebody may expect in that first visit, uh, and, and what they should not expect or not be afraid of happening? Yes. Well, I find, especially in, you know, the community, let's just say people of color, I find, again, that that equates to a lot of people saying, especially, again, for men, that you are considered weak if you go to therapy. Because, again, I think we've all heard the old adage of, you know, just go to church or pray it away or, mm -hmm. you know, 
I've heard that over and over and over again. And it's very surprising for a lot of the patients that I see who do come to the clinic, one, that I look like them. That's a, that's like a shocker for some of them. Even though I'm like, yo, I didn't check my page, you know, like my web page out because you would have seen them right on there grinning, you know. But they, they're still surprised because I think when they come in there, even though they're being told that they're going to be seeing me, they're still thinking they may see somebody else. And I think that also comes for from past experiences, yes. such as, you know, going to another place and they may have been thinking they were seeing one person and ended up with another person. But then they, they come in and they're still a little guarded, which I expect because I always go through the thing. I know you don't know me. I don't know you yet and we'll get to know each other. But I also let them know that I'm a real person. Mm -hmm. I, um, I feel like I'm transparent. I let them know they may see me in the neighborhood, like at Walmart shopping, okay. you know, and, and to let them know that, you know, nobody's you know, uh, without fault, nobody is, you know, on a pedestal, regardless to all the degrees you may see. My name is Shannon and I'm here to help you at the end of the day. That is all I'm here to do as far as my goal for you. And I always ask them, what do you want? Like, what do you want to get from this? Because, you know, I'm here because you're here, but the thing is you didn't have to come. So I always ask, what made you come? Sometimes mm. it's the girlfriend, the wife, the mother, whatever the case. At the end of the day, I said, you're here. That's so right. I don't care how they got there, yeah. but they're here, you know, and I let them know that that old adage of, you know, being, a, you know, coming for therapy, coming for medication management, it doesn't make you a weak person. It makes you a real person. It makes you a human right. being. It makes you a person that sees, I, I do have some stuff going on. I just don't know what I need to do about it, but right. that's what they're there for. So we can discuss that. So I don't yeah. see it as weak. I see it as somebody who's very strong, who took yes. the first step to come in. Yes. Strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awareness and self-awareness self one has to have to come and, Absolutely. And therapy. So that takes a lot, especially mm -hmm. for a man. I mean, it takes them a lot yeah. to come in there. I, so I always I let them know I appreciate it. Yes. I, I felt that, that way. It's not psych or men, but with parents, a lot of times... Yep when I would see parents of really young kids and they're bringing their kids in and a lot yes. of time people would think, Oh my goodness, this is such a ridiculous reason to bring your kid in or this. And yeah. That. I would say, you know, you care. It is so obvious how much you care yes. about your baby. You Absolutely. Know, they are so lucky to have you from have mom. you. <laughs> yes. yep, that's right. Yes. That's why I say I appreciate you. Yes. Now, Back to these physical complaints rooted mm -hmm. in um, mental uh, issues or, or suppressed, you know, feelings, emotions, et cetera. Uh, another thing I see in family practice, and I think it drives patients just as crazy as it does me, is mm -hmm. the psychosomatic pain and these pain oh, syndromes yeah. that have no origin, I mean, physical origin. Your x-ray is fine. Your MRI is fine. Your CT is fine. EKG is fine. Everything yep. is checking out. But I believe you when you say you hurt. And I think yeah. a lot of people also, you know, they want to be heard, but they want to be mm -hmm. helped. And with certain conditions, medicine isn't always as helpful as what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. For people listening who may have who may be exhausted, who may feel judged, who don't want to go back in for that same uh, low back pain that mm -hmm. is just coming up completely uh, fine on all the testing. Mm -hmm. What might you say to someone like that? Or, or how would you go about obtaining a history? You know, there's no injury, no mechanism mm -hmm. of injury, no car wreck, no slept wrong, nothing but they have this very real pain. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of patients that I'm dealing with that right now. I've had them before. Um, the biggest thing is I let them know is when they come in is um, they come into a judgment free zone mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, I, I let them know that their feelings are valid. Like I said, I can't, say if you're having pain or not but I do know from what you tell me you are but I don't know what that feels like because it's happening to you and not to me mm -hmm. so I let them know that they're being heard that their feelings are very valid and what I usually end up doing is I first obviously get records so I can kind of just look at everything which has helped me being a family nurse practitioner yeah. you know and doing the psychiatry side but it helps me kind of look and see everything that's been done I sometimes even look at things and I found some things where I feel like 
um, a little more may have, you know, could be done. You know, I found that too. But at the end of the day, I look at just, let's focus on like the mental health piece of this, because I said, even if we can't get you to where you need to be, you know, as far as pain-free, let's look if we can just change your, your spirit a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, let's see if we can make a difference there. And a lot of times we just go back to the past. I go back to even when they were kids, mm -hmm. believe it or not, you know, a lot of stuff in the way we are currently mm -hmm. goes back to our, our childhood, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of people, there's trauma in their childhood, but a lot of people suppress that. That never gets addressed, talked about it. It's one of those things, like it happened to me, they block it out and the show must go on. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that I find from like our young childhood that needed to be addressed and it yeah. just was never addressed. So that's usually what we, where we start at. Mm -hmm. We kind of take it all the way back. And then we kind of go forward and tie things together. But to be honest with you, um, therapy takes time, yes. you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honest with my yeah. patients and I let them know, like, this is not like going to be overnight. You didn't come in here for just like one visit. It does take time with therapy. Um, it can also take medication management as well, depending on the severity of the symptoms that a patient may be having. But a lot of it is just, you know, kind of going through their history seeing what's going on. And I, I meet my patients where they are. Some mm. people are ready. Some people are not. But my thing is if they keep coming back, I know they want help. That's, That's right. what I look at because mm. they don't have to come. Right. But I look at the fact that they keep coming back. Sometimes they come back because they just want to hear a little bit more, whether they're going to do, you know, what you suggest or not. But sometimes <laughs> they just want to hear a little bit more. But I think I'm doing something right if they keep coming back to me. And to me, that makes all the difference in the world, because, again, I'm there because they're there. If they're mm. not not there I can't do my work that's awesome that's awesome wow I I really um I could talk to you forever I've got all kinds <laughs> of stuff written down <laughs> I wish I could be your patient I wish I could come and see you how Aww. can people find you do you do video visits do you do do you have a brick and mortar clinic um how do they find you in the e streets on the internet as well as oh, in yes. person <laughs> Yeah, so I do have a brick and mortar. I do have a um a building, private practice, okay. and um we're starting for 2020. Uh, we're doing our telepsych visits, so mm -hmm. we're going to be starting telepsych visits as well. Um, Maryland, that's where I'm in, is one of the 29 states that you know people who have insurance, at least commercial insurance, their insurance will pay the same rate that it would be as if it were in-person visit. So we are looking to institute that. We we got everything going and in place, but that's coming. I've done a couple thus far, but those are for some of my private pay patients, but now the insurance part is coming. And you know, with that, it comes with a lot of red tape, obviously, it's right. insurance, you know how that goes, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they try to block everything, you know, but you know, you just have to make sure you have your everything together in order for everything to go through like it's supposed to. That's why that itself, that part of it is taking a little bit longer longer right. but um you know in regards to that i'm i'm on instagram too be well behavioral health i'm on facebook be well behavioral health our website is www.bewellbehavioralhealth um i'm in maryland right in glen burnie and um again i'm like you're if you come to my clinic i'm very laid back you know i i I have a lot of patients who can appreciate the fact that I'm not stuffy. I am, like I said, I'm laid back. Um, I'm, I'm non-judgmental. I mean, it's a nice place where we can kind of just relax and chill. And you kind of, it, it's not stuffy to the point where you feel like you're being, um, assessed. It's more of laid mm -hmm. back as if we're sitting around a coffee table and just, just talking, you know, kind of mm -hmm. informal. It makes mm -hmm. people more relaxed and more open. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Okay. Well, we know where to find you online. Uh, I thank you so much for taking time out of your day. This is oh no problem. I could talk about mental health all day. I could all day. too. I could too. But you know what? I'm not ready to go back to school yet. <laughs> and you know what? You don't have to because yeah. you know my thing was I can appreciate. That's why I said I I am a family nurse practitioner, but I mm -hmm. knew that I didn't have enough to teach my patients to help them the way right. I needed to, because we get a little blurb in school. But once I've seen like 15 minutes visits and they say, Oh, they have depression, find out it's really bipolar. Right. But I only got 15 minutes. And right. the thing is, if you prescribe medication, it can be so wrong and that can be detrimental for some exactly. patients. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I went to school for that reason alone, just yeah. to kind of get that piece. But I knew that that was psychiatry. I love it. I feel like it's uh, so much 
broader than it, you know, it's not just anxiety, depression. Right. It's so much broader right. than that, you know, yeah. and I'm not just talking about schizophrenia. I'm talking about real life situations that I think all of us are in when we feel overwhelmed, stressed, and we want to just kind of, we want to check out. I mean, I, I tell my patients, you ever drive up in front of your house and want to keep driving sometimes? Uh -huh. I do. Yeah, just I've sit, done that. Look, you sit know? in the garage for a minute. Yes. Now like, I don't. I'm, sometimes yes. I don't even go in the garage because they hear the door and then come out into the garage. So I'll park there in front of it and just gather <laughs> them. There you go. That but is exactly what I'm talking true. about. It's true. But yeah. you have to let people know it's okay to feel that way. We can feel that way. The thing is, we don't want to get stuck feeling that exactly. way. Exactly. There exactly. you go, right? So we, it's valid. Just You're feeling adjusting. the valid. Just adjusting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, so we don't want to get stuck. So, you know, there, there it is. I think it's just real life, real, real issues. You know, we all have them. But yeah. the thing is, we just don't want to get stuck in it. And the thing is, how do you react to those issues? Right. You know? And do you have the tools to not get stuck? Because yes. Because a lot of times I think people just don't, we don't want to be stuck. Just like nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants exactly. to be stuck. Exactly. But we don't have the tools to get unstuck. Unstuck. So there you go. That's where awesome yep. people like you come in. Be Why, well. Thank you. Behavioral health. I'm so yes. glad to have. I got a spreadsheet of mm -hmm. of people, and I, I call my spreadsheet the NP unit. So oh, I, I love it. When I come <laughs> across people who are looking for someone like you, or or someone like some of the other nurse practitioners I've been meeting and talking with, I can just say, Hey, you might want. You where are you at, Marilyn? You might want to check yep. her out. Because we're out here, and I think that's another thing uh, with the with the healthcare system and some of the barriers that we have to even going and getting established. Yes. It's like we have this picture in our mind of these stuffy people in white coats who have yes. won't make eye contact, have ten minutes to talk to us, yep. and then on the way, it's like, no, y'all, there's a whole nother layer yes. of this. Yes, and nurse practitioners. You know, our training is a nursing model. It's not a yes. medical model. So we inherently are a little um, broad in our approach, yes. a little more comprehensive in yes, our because, yep. histories. And, and uh, we're scientists, too. You can't take that Ab from us. Absolutely. We're scientists, too. But absolutely. The humanities are strong. Yes, so, because um, of where we came from. We started right. the bedside, and I tell my patients, that's that right. never leaves me, never leaves never. me. That's why we're good teachers. That's right. You know, we're advocates for our patients. That's right. who we are. Yep, that is who we are. I'm proud to be in the number, and it's me too. so great talking with you. I'll go ahead and put Shannon Holder's contact information and website in the show notes. If you are listening and identify with some of what we were talking about, physical complaints, headaches, back pain, stomach issues that no one has been able to understand or figure out what was causing them, you might consider talking with your primary care provider about a referral for counseling or mental health services. Listen, there's no shame in it. We will all have times in our life when we need a little bit of extra support to help us adjust with the changes that life is always throwing our way. Thanks so much for listening. Keep listening to see how to find me as well. Thank you for listening to The Purple Stethoscope. I'm your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. You can find me on social media at D the NP. That's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and now Patreon. If you like what you heard, go ahead and share this episode and then head over to Patreon to see how you can further support this work. <laughs>